with us. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three. I think this is our fourth or fifth week in uh, chapter number three. And it's been good. Every bit of it's been good. We've been learning that we are a new creature. We're a new person, a new man. Things are different when you get saved. I need a witness. Amen. Amen. Well, we've learned that if you are a new man, and I say man, man, woman, mankind, we are a new person. When you are new in Christ, a new man means a new home. If, if you get something changed at church, it'll change it at home. And so I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to title it really new man, new home, but uh, we just changed it around to home sweet home. And if things are the way God intends for it to be, it will be home, sweet home. home, sweet home. So let's look in Colossians chapter three. In, 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 uh, uh, let's see, let's start in verse number 18. And let's read down to verse 21, 18 to 21. And then we'll let you, we'll pray and you can sit down, okay? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. discouraged. Now, let's pray and, and we'll get started tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I know that you know all things. I know that you know how much rain we need and how dry it's been. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'll let it just calm down to a Bible study and then let it rain whatever you want it to rain. I pray that we can be able to hear, comprehend, understand, and be able to learn and grow tonight. I pray that you'll honor your word, Lord, as we study. And I pray that we'll apply it to our lives. And God will thank you, we'll praise you, and we'll give you all the glory and all the honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Tonight, I want to, I want to start. We're not going to be able to get all of these verses. Uh, but I want to start there and, and kind of do a little series on the home, on the family. Uh, because there's just too much to say for each one of these sections uh, to get it all done in one night. Uh, is there any doubt? Is there any doubt whatsoever that the homes in America are in trouble? I mean, there's no doubt about that. There's no question. There's no way that any sane human being can look in our country and look in the shape of our homes and the shape of our marriages and in the shape of our communities because the communities go by way of the homes and the families uh, that you can't say there's a problem. And there's, there is a, we, we are in trouble. And, and so a lot of times when people say, well, I just believe the Bible's outdated. Well, it seems like the further we get from the Bible, the worse things get. And I want to ask the communities and I want to ask the culture, how's it working for you? How's the, how's that abuse rate? How is that divorce rate? How is that, uh, uh, uh the, the situation with the kids and, and, and all that we are seeing in our, our country, not just in our country, in the world as a whole. I want to say, how's that working for you? Now, I want to, I want to start this. I want to start this uh, because sometimes when you, when you preach the Bible and you teach the Bible, it's really, it's really politically incorrect. It really is. It goes completely against the culture. It goes completely against what people think. And the problem is a lot of that garbage and a lot of that mindset has creeped into the church. And, and so we get stiff necked and, and we get, we get an attitude. And, and so here's what I want to do. I, I, I remember several, several years ago, several years ago, there was a, a pastor from Georgia that called me and just kept on and on and, and, and said, man, the Lord has told me to call you. And, and, and this is the Lord's will for you uh, to come help me. And I, I really, I really need your help, man. I'm willing to do whatever. Our church is, is, is really a mess. It's, it's dying. And, and, and I just need your help. Well, I finally gave in and not that I didn't have enough to do, but I just, I, you know, it's hard for me to say no. And, and so I got over there and sat down with him in the, in the office. And I, I, I remember this to this day. 
the very first conversation we had, he began to talk about things and what he had done and, and, and all the stuff he'd done and been doing. And, and then he began to tell me all the things he wasn't going to do. And I'm like, dude, why did you call me? Now, if you are telling me everything you've done and everything you're not going to do, uh, how, how's it working for you? So why should I even tell you anything if you've done made up your mind what you're going to do? You say, what does that got to do with tonight? I need every person. I need every person. Now, we're going to start with the wives tonight. This, this is going to be the first because this is the first one in the, in the verse. And, and, and you men, are, you're going to have a temptation to want to hackle and laugh and, and, and shout and amen. But remember, you're next. You're next. And you're going to learn some stuff and you're going to see some stuff that is politically totally incorrect. But I got to ask you, how's it working for you? If you don't like what this Bible's saying and you don't believe in doing what this Bible says to do, how's that working for you? I can tell you how it's working for our country. It, you just look around. And so just keep that in mind. Everything that I'm going to give you tonight is straight from the Bible, straight from God's word. And it's really enlightening. And I want to encourage you ladies. I want to encourage you ladies. Don't don't shut me off a quarter way through. Don't shut me off in the first point. Wait till the very, very end. And and just just I promise you, just hold tight to the very end, and I promise you, you'll be okay with what God has to say. And all God's people say it. Amen. All right, let's, let's go. Number one, <clears throat> first we see in, 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 the, in the new home, in the new home, God has responsibilities for each individual. He begins with the wives, then he talks to the husbands, and then he, then he talks to the children, and then he comes back and talks to the fathers. And he gives them instruction. He gives them what, what he wants them to do and how he wants them to be in their responsibilities. And so let's take verse number 18. We'll just, we'll just do one verse here in this and bring the parallels of, of these verses with, with what Ephesians has to say and what First Peter has to say. Because they are, they are parallel verses that go with this particular teaching. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Verse 18. Everybody, everybody say it. Everybody say it. You ready? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Let's read it again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, number one, number one, we're going to go through this kind of quickly because I'm going to, ladies, I'm going to help you do this. I'm going to help you do this. I'm going to give you some, some, some very helpful tips and how to accomplish God's purpose and the biblical way to submit to your husband. Number one, I want you to see the responsibility to submit. The responsibility to submit. This is, this is not a suggestion, this is a command. This is a direct command from God. We have a responsibility to submit. Colossians 3 verse 18 says, wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Ephesians 5, verse 22 and verse 24. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. Therefore, as the, he gives the illustration. As the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 1 Peter 3, 1. Likewise, ye wives... Be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So we see, without a doubt, there is a clear teaching and a clear command for submission. Now, three, two things I want to give you underneath this. Write this down. First, let's look at the definition of submit. In case we don't understand what that word means, let's, let's, let's look at the biblical definition. And I, I put both of them. I put the Greek definition... And then I put Webster's definition, okay? Webster's 1828. I love using Webster's 1828 because it kind of goes along with the King James Bible and helps you uh, see some of the archaic words that are there. But in the Greek, the word submit is, is two words. It's two words put together. Hupo and tasso. 
hupo and tasso. One means under and the other means to arrange in an orderly manner. In other words, you are, you are placed under order or orderly under. It's, it's the same principle. It's a military term. In other words, it's a ranking to place under in rank, not in superiority, not in, it doesn't mean you're inferior to that person. It just means there is an order and there is a rank. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. All right, now here's Webster's 1828. Means to yield, it means to yield, to resign or surrender to the power, will or authority of another. And primarily speaking in, in scripture is the authority. The authority that God put and placed on the responsibility of the man. And we'll hear more about that next week. All right, so we see the definition. I, I think it's, it's very clear. There's no question what the, the, the defined uh, uh, understanding of the word submit. Now, let's see what it looks like. Biblically speaking, biblically speaking, what does this look like? In, in a home, in a, a marriage relationship with a man and a woman, what does submission look like biblically? All right, so we see the details in submission. Write that down. <coughs> And we're going to go through the Bible and see what does it look like. All right. The details in submission. Look in Titus, Titus 2, verse number 3. It's right there in your notes. I put it all there so we didn't have to look it up. Titus 2, verse 3. It says, Paul is telling Titus what to tell the church. And he's teaching the older women and telling them what they need to be teaching the younger women. Did y'all see that? Listen, it's not the culture or the TV that should be teaching our younger women how to, how to deal in the home. It should be the older women. That's what God says. He says, this is what I want you to do. That the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, read it with me now, obedient to their own, that the word of God be not blasphemed. First Peter 3, 6. It says, even as Sarah, what? Obeyed, Obeyed Abraham. So write this down, number one. The first detail we see in, in biblical submission is the obedience involved. The obedience involved. <clears throat> then number two. Number two, not only it says be obedient to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, but number two, we see the respect involved. The respect involved. This is massive. This is huge. And I'm going to show you in just a second. Ephesians 5 verse 33. This is in the same set of verses that are describing biblical submission for a, a wife towards the husband. And this is, what it, this is what it says in the very last verse of that chapter, of chapter five. Nevertheless, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and read it with me, and the, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. To be in awe, to respect. I looked the word up. First Peter 3. It says, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning or the plating of the hair of a wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. This is the same, same set of verses that we read a while ago uh, where, where Peter is teaching the, the ladies to be submissive to their husband and their behavior. He said, what should be attractive about you is not the outward appearance. It's not uh, the clothes that you put on. It's not the makeup that you wear. It's what's on the inside. It's what's on the inside. Now, what should be on the inside? Look what it says, verse four. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Listen, the Bible teaches that, that Sarah reverenced Abraham calling him Lord. Now I'm not telling you, you got to call your husband Lord, but you get the point. You get the point. 
Do you realize, ladies, that the greatest need that a man has is your respect? The greatest need that a woman has, men, is your love. She needs to feel completely adored and loved and secure. But ladies, he needs to feel respected. Let me tell you this. You can shower love on him all you want to, but if you don't show him respect, he will not feel that love. Because that's the way that God wired him. Now, Shanti failed, failed I think it's failed on, uh, she wrote, she wrote and did a, a survey and did a lot of research in this particular area about the man's need for respect. And this is, this is what she wrote and this is what she come up with. A man's highest need is to feel respect, whereas a woman's highest need is to feel love. Marriage expert and researcher Shanti Feldhahn came to the conclusion after a scientific study into what men really need. But she first came to that realization while on a singles retreat before she got married. This retreat speaker said that the same thing that I said in the book and asked the men on the survey, which is to recognize that for women, the highest need in general is to feel loved and cherished. But the highest need for a man is to feel his wife's respect and trust and admiration and honor. Shanti says that, that we can lavish lots of love on our husbands and that's great. But as she says, if we don't show also that we respect them and maybe criticize them in public or question their decisions all the time, they're going to feel disrespected. And when they uh, and says and then they won't feel loved. And then she asked the question, do you th ever think about how to respect your husband? How do we do that? What does that look like? What is respecting our husband? What does it look like in real life? Well, she gives several different, several different examples to help understand what this would look like. First, she said, respect his judgment. Respect his judgment. A man deeply needs the woman in his life to respect his knowledge, opinions, and decisions. What I would call, she says, his judgment. Many men wish their mate would question, wouldn't question their knowledge or argue with their decisions all the time. It's a touchy and difficult thing in these liberated days, but what it really comes down to is their need for us to defer to them. Several men confessed that they felt like their opinions and decisions were actively uh, valued in every area of their lives except at home. Some men felt that their comrades at work trusted their judgment more than their own wives did. Also, while a man's partners or colleagues will rarely tell him what to do, they ask him or collaborate on the decision instead. More than one wife has made the mistake of ordering her husband around like one of the kids. She says one of the greatest ways you can respect him is respect his judgment. Number two, respect his abilities. Another strong theme that emerged was that men won't even need to figure things out for themselves. And if they can, they feel like they have conquered something and are affirmed as men. For some reason, spending hours figuring out how to put together the new DVD player is fun. Problem is, is we want to help. Now, this is coming from a lady, all right? This is why it's coming from her side. It says we want to help them. And guess how they interpret that? You got it. Distrust. It's a wonder any relationship works and that the human race didn't die out a millennia ago. Of course, our attention is not all benign. Sometimes we truly don't have confidence that our man can figure something out on his own. The little things equal one big clue. We don't realize that the act of forcing ourselves to trust our men in little things means so much to them, but it does. It's not a big deal to us, so we don't get that it's a big deal to them. We don't get that our responses to these little choices to trust or not to trust or at least act like we do, are interpreted as signs of overall trust and respect for them as men. A man might think of it like this. If she doesn't trust me in something as small as finding my way along a road, why should she trust me in something important like being a good breadwinner or a good father? If she doesn't trust me in the small thing, she probably doesn't really respect me at all. The next time your husband stubbornly drives in circles, ask yourself what is more important, being on time to the party or feel or his feeling trusted. She said, no contest. Amen. <laughs> Number three, 
respect and communication. Respect and communication. Women hold an incredible power in the way we communicate with our men, both husbands and sons, to build them up or tear them down, to encourage or to exasperate. Some things just push a man's buttons. This goes beyond what we say, such as questioning a man's judgment or his abilities, and into how we say it and where we say it. What is the subject of the next, of the next section of the book? She said, there, here's the disconnect. In her interviews, a large number of men said something like this. When my wife says something disrespectful, I often think I can't believe she doesn't know how that makes me feel. I had to reassure these men over and over that their wives probably didn't mean to respect them and were likely clueless that it even happened. She said respect in not only communication, but respect in public. Massive, massive. Now we come to one of the most important points of the book. There appears to be an epidemic of public disrespect for men. And the biggest culprit is not the televisions, movies, or other media, but the women who are supposed to love their men the most. Dozens of men told me how painful it is when their wives criticize them in public, put them down, or even question their judgment in front of others. One man on the survey said that one thing he wished he could tell his wife was that at a minimum, she should be supportive of him in public. That wish was repeated dozens and dozens of times in the survey. It was one of the strongest themes that emerged. Consider this statement, which she said she heard in essence from many men. My wife says things about me in public that she considers teasing, but I consider them torture. Be respectful even when he's absent, she said. Having seen how important public respect is to men, it is almost impossible to overstate. I have become incredibly sensitive to how often we might talk negatively about them behind their backs. The effects are much the same even when a man isn't present. The women's disrespect of her husband becomes even more deeply embedded as she harps on it, and those in listening range may begin to feel the same. Then the last one, you can respect his assumptions. Respect in our assumptions. Unfortunately, in one area, men have every right to read something into what we say. And that is when we have jumped to negative conclusions about them. When we really examine our communication, we'll be astounded at how often it assumes something bad about the man we love. See if this assumption rings a bell. Here's the question, or, or here's the assumption. We assume he needs to be reminded. He needs to be reminded. Now to us, repeatedly asking, have you done it yet, is probably not a big deal. But inherent in the question is our assumption that the guy needs the reminder, that he is either incapable of remembering on his own or that he remembers just fine, but needs our prodding to do the job. What they are accurately hearing is, I don't trust you. Just realize that his reason for not doing it may be different than yours. Remembering, ha remember half of the men in the survey indicated that sometimes they just have different priorities or they, could just, um, or they could just be unable to handle one more thing. One man with a stressful job noted that he sometimes feels like a computer that will crash if he tries to load one more thing onto it. For him, procrastinating on something his wife wants him to do at home is his warning sign that he will emotionally crash if he tries to. She is mentioning over and over things in ways that we show disrespect or we can show respect. And I, I want everybody to know this. This is massively, massively a big deal for men. Uh, you may not think so, you may not believe it, but it is a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, it, 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 and it really doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter if the man has the respect of the whole world he feels like a failure if he doesn't have the respect of the only one that matters. Amen. So ladies, please, please show him respect. And before you say, well, he's really not respectable. I'm going to deal with that too. I'm going to deal with that too. But I don't see anywhere where God says, okay, ladies, respect your husband if he deserves it. Nowhere does it say that. 
And you're going to find out, you're going to find out that there was a certain way that Sarah treated Abraham. And everybody said, oh, but he's Abraham. Abraham was a weasel. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. All right. So how do we, how do, what is the biblical, what is the biblical picture of submission? We see the obedience involved. We see the respect involved. It says we are to reverence our husbands. Number three, I want you to see the trust involved. The trust involved. And this is where you're going to get some help. Say, preacher, I married a goober. I understand. I understand. But you picked him. You picked him. Now you got to live with him. <clears throat> but watch this. We go back. We go back to Peter. Peter. We go back to first Peter. Peter's instructing the wise and he's, he's telling them, listen, just the same thing that Paul's telling them to submit to their husbands. And then he begins to describe and he brings in an Old Testament illustration of Sarah. All right. And how Sarah treated Abraham and how the holy women of old. The holy women of old, how they submitted and respected and reverenced and honored, even to the point of calling Abraham Lord. Now, how were they able to do that? Because I really, I really had to question that. And the only reason I stuck with it, because I knew it was in the Bible and the Bible can't lie. Amen. So I know it happened, but I wondered how did it happen? How is it possible that Sarah was able to do that after he lied to save his own skin. Do you realize that, that Sarah was a hottie? She was very good looking. They came into Egypt and, and, and Abraham was afraid that they were going to kill him to take her. So he told her, just tell him we're not married. You're my sister. In other words, he was willing to, to give her up to save his own skin. That is a weasel. I need a witness, ladies. That's not, that's not someone that you would call Prince Charming. But guess what? She did it anyway. You see what I'm saying? But how did she do that? How did she do that? Look at this verse. Look at this verse. 1 Peter 3, 5. 1 Peter 3, 5. It says, for after this manner in the old time, the what kind of women? Holy women also, watch this now. You didn't hear me say, trust your husband. Who did they trust? Look what it says. Who? Who trusted in God. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, everybody needs to know this, that this teaching is in the realm of a saved relationship. This teaching is in the realm of a Christian home because he goes into teaching the Christian husband next. Are y'all with me? Now, some people have taken this so far to, to say this teaches women that they are supposed to stay in abusive situations where they're being harmed. That's baloney. That's not true. That's not what this is teaching. It's teaching how to be the best wife. And next week, we're going to show how to be the best husband. Now, this is one thing that I've, I've learned and I've had to learn this the hard way. I cannot change Tammy. And Tammy learned the hard way. She cannot change me. I'm not responsible for her happiness. She's not responsible for my happiness. I'm not responsible for how she is in her godly life. She's not responsible for how I am. I am. Regardless of how she treats me, I still have an accountability to God on how I treat her. Are y'all with me? Amen. Now, so, so don't leave and say, well, well he just, I don't, I don't believe, you know, there's some husbands that wait till the end. That's why I said you can't, you got to wait till the end. This is in the realm, this is in the realm of a Christian home, a Christian relationship. Listen. You're not trusting in your husband. When, it, when, when God says to submit to him in his leadership, in his guidance, in his understanding, he's saying, trust me. Amen. 
Because he is submitted to Christ. He is to follow Christ. And you're under the umbrella of God's protection as long as you're doing what God said to do. Amen. So you're trusting God. I'm going to do, ladies, you can do what seems impossible to do by trusting God. Sarah wasn't trusting Abraham. Sarah was submitted to Abraham. Sarah obeyed Abraham. She even respected Abraham. And she was able to do that because she was trusting in God who commanded her to do that. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. So we see the details in submission. Number two. Number two, we see the reasoning the reasoning for submission. Why would God say that? Why would God command that? <clears throat> well, in Ephesians chapter number five, the parallel verse, Ephesians chapter number five, it says in verse 22, y'all still with me? Amen. Everybody still awake? Everybody still awake? Amen. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For, in other words, this is the reason why, for the husband is the head of the wife. Say that with me. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. All right. Number one, number one, or no, excuse me. I didn't give you eight. All right. We see the reasoning for submission. First, there's a placement of order. There is a divine placement of order. A divine placement of order. Okay. Number one, I want you to see this. The designation for order. The designation for order. <clears throat> Basically this. If someone's, if someone's going to lead, then that just bears to the fact that somebody's got to follow. There's got to be an order. How many of y'all have ever heard the phrase, there's too many chiefs and not enough? That's what's wrong with a lot of homes today. Anything with two heads is a freak. It is. And you're not going to have anything but turmoil. Now watch, watch what we'll learn about order. Watch what we'll learn about order. First Corinthians 14, 13, or 14, 33. 14, 33. For God is not the author of what? Confusion. Confusion but of peace. But of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God is not the author of confusion. God didn't start it. God didn't ordain it. He didn't like it. He don't want it. What is confusion? Here's a definition. Say it with me. And disorder. Instability and disorder. Now watch what he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Let how many things? All, all things. Could we put marriage there? Yeah. Absolutely. Let all things be done decently and in order. order. Now watch what the definition of order is. Regular Arrangement, come on, regular arrangement. arrangement, fixed succession of rank or character. In other words, there's got to be order. God designed the home to have order. He does not like chaos and he does not like disorder. So there has to be a ranking. There has to be a design so that they know the chain of command. Can you imagine in our world today? Well, you can't imagine it. Just, just, look at, just look at Oregon. Look at Portland right now. When there's no chain of command, when there's no order, when there, are y'all with me? When there's no leadership, when there's no, come on, y'all getting quiet. There's chaos. When there's no order, there's chaos. Well, God has designed the home to have order just like the church, just like government. There's three institutions God ordained. Three institutions God ordained. First, the home, government. Hello, y'all with me? And the church. All three of them are designed to have, what's that old word? Order. order. If you don't have order, you will have what? Chaos. 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 
So God designed the home to have order. In order to have order, you have to have a placement of rank. Somebody has got to be a leader. Somebody's got to be a leader. Now watch, who did God, who did God design that to be? He designed the man. He designed him to be the head. The word head means a chief, a chief, a principal person, a leader, a commander, one who has the first rank or place and to whom others are subordinate as the head of an army or the head of a, a sect or party. And by the way, this is out of Webster's 1828 and it gives you the same verse that we've been studying. So you know that's the definition. What's the point? God made Adam, and, and by the way, ladies, don't think that this happened after the fall. This happened before the fall. God made Adam responsible. He was the leader. He designed this world with order. Now watch what happens. Watch what happens. Eve got things out of order. And she took steps outside of the umbrella of the authority of her husband and caused what? Chaos. Chaos. Now watch this though. Watch this though. This is, this is mind blowing. Who took the fruit? Eve did. But who did God hold responsible? That's right. God didn't go, God didn't come to the garden and say, Eve, he went to. You know why? Because he was the head. He was the head. Now watch what happens. It, it, when you put all this stuff together, it's amazing what starts coming out. Do you know what, you know one of the responsibilities a man has, a husband has, is not to be bitter toward his wife. And you know what the first thing that Adam did? He blamed her. That's a picture of bitterness. Hello? Think how all this is. God wants order. You say, well, I just don't like none of that. Well, how, you, how do you like what's going on right now? Our, our homes are a mess. Listen, there was designation by God, divine designation. God gave each person a role. One's not better than the other. One's not inferior to the other. One's not superior to the other. They just have different roles. There's a designation for order. Then look at number two. They are designed for order. God designed men and women to fulfill the role that he has given them for the purpose of having order and not chaos. Let me read that again. Because this is just going to chap everybody in the culture today. God designed men and women, I should put right here, differently. To fulfill the role that he has given them for the purpose of having order. I could give you page after page after page of differences. I'm talking about from the brain everywhere, every part of the human person. And every part that's different is different so they can accomplish the role God gave them. I'm gonna just give you one real simple one and we can move on because I got a bunch of stuff I wanna give you. Men, muscles are bigger. Their lungs are bigger. They need stamina. They need strength. You know why? Because God designed the husband to protect and provide. So God designed him that way. God made him that way. God made him not to care about stuff. God made him not to care about stuff. There's so much stuff that wigs you women out, we don't give a rip. We just keep right on going. We just keep right on working. We just keep right on doing what we gotta do. Things that will blow you out the water, we don't care. All the men say it. And all the ladies, you know I'm right. But guess how he designed Guess how he designed the wife? 
soft, caring, with feelings. You know why? Because she's the nurturer. She's the one that cares for the young, the keeper at home, the queen of the castle. We're not the same. If we were the same, we wouldn't need each other. God designed us for the role that he gave us. And all of this same gender garbage is going on right now and, and, and all this stuff, it is, a, it is a spit in the eye of God and it is causing unbelievable chaos. Listen, there's a designation for order. There is a design for order. God designed it that way. Now, what is the, we're talking about, here's, here's the point, the reasoning for submission. Ladies, wives, why is he asking you to submit to him? Because that is the role that he has given the husband and that is the role he has given to you. You are the helpmeet. You are the completer, not the competer. Say it with me, the completer. Now, not only, not only, is there a designation for order? Watch this. There, or, or the placement of order, the placement of order, but B, look at the power of behavior. This is massive. Watch this. Watch what Peter says in verse number one, 1 Peter 3, 1. <clears throat> it says, 1 Peter 3, 1, likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, if any obey not the word. Now, technically, this is talking about unsaved spouses. But guess what? You can also apply it. A saved spouse that's not acting like it. You, how many of y'all know you can be a saved person and not obey the word? I mean, look around. Look at all the empty seats. The Bible says don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. They did. Right? So, so we can apply this to not only a lost husband, but a husband that's not acting right. Can we say that? Amen. Look what it said. Look what Peter says. If, if you will be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be may without the word. That means not dragging them to church. Preacher, I can't get my, 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 my husband. He just won't come to church. Don't worry about it. According to this, keep, keep praying for him. Keep, keep inviting him. But listen, it's not. It, it, he says you can win them without the word. Without the word. Also, you can apply this without you nagging them. <laughs> without you preaching at them. Without you telling them everything they're doing wrong. Without you telling them to turn or burn. <laughs> Without the word. How? Watch this. Watch what he says. Now, what are we reading? Come on, somebody over here. What are we reading? The Bible. The Bible. It says that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the what? The word conversation means your behavior. Your behavior. They can be won by the conversation of the wives while they, the unbelieving husband or the husband that's not obeying the word, while they behold, in other words, they're looking at you and watching your life, your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Preacher, what are you saying? Ladies, I don't think you understand the powerful influence that you have. I don't think you understand. Let's think about this. The strongest man ever to live, Samson, a woman got him. The smartest man ever to live, a woman got him. The man closest to God's own heart, David, you guessed it, 
A woman influenced him. The first man, Adam. A woman had a powerful influence on him. Preacher, what are you saying? Now, obviously, in all of these situations that we named, it was an influence for bad. But what if they had good intentions? Imagine what could have been done and imagine how much influence that you have. Listen, in these situations, feminine power was used for harm, but it was not designed that way. It was supposed to be for great good. God created wives to be a completer or helper of husbands. A wife has incredible power through her words, her attitude, and her sexuality. Solomon acknowledged this when he penned these, this proverb. Watch what Solomon said. Remember, he's that wise guy. A wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Proverbs 14, 1. You see, a wife's power of influence is either going to be used to build the home or tear it down. You have an incredible power with your submission, with your, the way you respect your husband, the way you love your husband, the way you treat your husband, your behavior in front of him has an incredible influence on him. Let me give you five, well, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, let me give you five ways to influence him. Say, preacher, my husband's not acting right. Okay, here's what you do. First, pray for him. Pray for him. It would blow your mind how many times that people come to my office with problems and issues and the first question I ask, hey, have you prayed about this? Uh. How many of y'all believe in prayer? Listen, let's practice it. Maybe the Lord will change him. Maybe the Lord will change him. And perhaps you should ask him to transform him. So pray. Now, pray with reason. Now, Paul, he prayed for the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, 4. And you know what his prayer was? Thank you, God, for the Corinthians. Thank you, God, for the Corinthians. Now, Paul spent time thanking God for the Corinthians in Listen, I appeal to you in to spend time thanking God for your husband. If you do not have affection for the person that you want to help, the help you offer may blow up on you. Paul had an extravagant love for the Corinthians, which paved the way for him to be able to correct them. He was able to influence them because they knew that he loved them. Are y'all with me? Say amen. So how do you influence your husband? How do you influence your husband? By praying for him. Number two, win with encouragement. Win with encouragement. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. The word edifying means building up. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Make sure your words have a building up effect rather than a corrupting, tearing down effect. A word fitly spoken can transform your world. You have power in your words. You can draw your husband to you and Christ by what you say, or you can push him farther away. One of the most effective assessment questions you can ask in this regard, ask your husband, ask your husband this, what do you experience more from me, my encouragement or my displeasure? What do you experience more from me, my encouragement or my displeasure? If you want to influence your husband well, be courageous and grace-filled enough to check your blind spots. Ask him about his experience with you. Sometimes we treat each other in, in the home uh, kind of like employers do. And, and by the way, he covers that too in Colossians. We're all, we, we never... We never address our employers until they do something wrong. How many of y'all have ever heard uh, the book, uh, uh, oh my goodness, The one, or one Minute Manager? Has anybody ever heard of the book One Minute Manager? I would encourage everybody to read that book. Everybody to read that book. It teaches you to catch them doing something right. 
And so you can, you can affirm them and brag on them. So man, you did a good job cutting them weeds over there. That was, and I mean, I, 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 it's been a long time I've seen weeds cut like that. And what are you doing? You're putting in their account. You're, 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 you're investing in them. You're, you're, you're building up the praise. You remember several years ago, I preached with, about the uh, uh, leading children. And what did we say? For every seven for, excuse me, for every one negative thing you say to your child, it takes seven positives to counteract just to bring you back to zero. Seven to one. And it's the same principle abroad. You know what's happening? We're writing checks with an empty account and we're wondering why we're fighting like cats and dogs. Listen, influence with encouragement. Does your husband experience more of your encouragement? or more of what you don't like. Number three, you can influence him by praying for him, win with encouragement, make it easy. Make it easy. Say, so, what do you mean? In Genesis 3, 7, it says the eyes of them both were open. When Adam and Eve, they, they took of the fruit, their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. What were they trying to do? They were trying to hide. They were trying to cover their faults. They were trying to hide their failure. Your husband is a proud, self-reliant person, believe it or not. And he does not want to show weakness. Men are wired to be strong and impenetrable. Throw in a little sin and what you get is a person who does not want to reveal his flaws to anyone, especially to his wife. He wants to impress you which makes your condemnation and criticism of him even more painful. Perhaps he has given up on impressing you. Now this condition is not hopeless, it just means we got a little more work to do. One of the most effective things that the Lord does to win us to himself is by make, watch this now, this is huge. One of the most effective things the Lord does to win us to himself is by making it crystal clear that he is for us. Romans eight thirty one. say amen. The more your husband knows you are for him, the more you will be able to influence him. How many of y'all have ever heard the phrase, people don't care how much you know till they know and all God's people say it. Amen. Lastly, under influence, lastly, under influence, pick your spots. Uh, Kenny Rogers said it so well, you got to know when to hold them. <laughs> say it with me. Know when to fold them. There's a right time to open your mouth and there's a time to keep it shut. Amen. How many of y'all know you can say the right thing at the wrong time and it'd be a disaster? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Listen, Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Amen. Be careful about confronting him head on when you're angry. This is unwise and unhelpful. Know your audience. Find a non-fight time to talk to your husband. The moment of your disappointment is not the best time to talk about what is wrong with him. You are more than likely going to stay, say it in the wrong way, which will only exacerbate the already negative situation. Find a vulnerable time to talk to him. These are those moments when he's not as defensive and you're not as disappointed, and it could be when you're already talking civilly and you feel his receptivity to what you are saying. Pick your, pick your, pick your spots, pick your battle. Now listen, let me give you, let me give you uh, uh, the, the third one because we're about done. No, I'm gonna give you this illustration real quick. When I was in the, I think it was the fourth grade, when, when was Miss Buckner my teacher? Fourth grade? Fourth grade. I think it was fourth grade. Whatever it was, it was when they were doing the multiplication flashcards, whatever grade that is. And, uh, and she made a game out of it. She's like the number one teacher of all time. I mean, without a doubt. I know all you teachers in here and don't take offense to this, but you're second to her, period. <laughs> she was the best, no questions asked, Miss Brenda Buckner. And I hope she's watching tonight. Uh, I think she lives in Indiana now or Ohio, somewhere up there, but she is the best, the best. One, one day she we was playing a game with these flashcards because she would always try to make it fun and if you won a certain amount of flashcards, you got an ice cream. 
Well, I had one more to get my ice cream. And the kids were voting on who got it first, and I was beside a kid named Thomas Hamilton. Thomas Hamilton was a little slow, he was a little different, and, and they were right. I won, but they gave it to him. Oh, was I furious. <laughs> Son, I was so mad, I mean, I'm just, I'm fighting mad. I'm, 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 I'm Fred Sanford, man, I'm telling you. I, I got tears coming down, I'm hollering, I'm screaming. You're lying, y'all cheating me, I'm ready to fight everybody. Miss Brenda, Miss Brenda Buckner took me outside. I can remember it to this day, just like it was yesterday. There was a little bench right outside the, the water fountain and she sat me down on that water fountain and I'm pleading my case and I'm screaming, and I'm hollering, and I'm crying. I'm telling you, you know, they cheated me, Miss Buckner. And this is what she done. Malcolm. I'm like way up here in the volume. She says, Malcolm, it's okay. Miss Buckner, you know, you know, they cheated. They did it. They cheated. She says, Malcolm, Malcolm. It's okay. Miss Buckner, you know they done it. You know they cheated. They don't like preacher's kids. They did it. They did it. <laughs> Malcolm, it's going to be okay. You know what I did? Okay. <laughs> what did she do? She practiced that verse. Right. A soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. You want to you stop the arguing? Drop the volume. Stay cool, calm. I didn't say it was easy. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And I'm telling you, it works. Do you realize this is the fourth grade and that image and that memory is blazoned in my head? It was that powerful. Ladies, you have a great influence on your husband. You have a great power and a great, listen, God has given you something to influence them for good or evil. How are you going to use it? Now, remember what I said, stay till the very, end. stay the very end. Number three, what are the regulations? What are the regulations to this submitting stuff? I mean, just what, how much stuff we got to submit? How far does that go? Well, Paul's word to wives is to be submissive to their husbands. They do not, their own husbands, by the way, they do not submit to some detached impersonal authority. Rather, they submit to the man with whom they have an intimate, personal, vital relationship. Now, here's what I want you to see. <clears throat> here's what I want you to see. Number one. Now, I changed it. I hope I changed it on y'all's because I, I got my old paper and I didn't copy my new one. But number one, mutual submission to one another is first. Is that number one on y'all's? It's, it's supposed to be. Okay. Mutual submission to one another is first. What does that look like? In Ephesians 5.21, Ephesians 5.21, read it with me. Ephesians 5.21. Did y'all see that? Submitting yourselves one to another. another. Now, what does that mean? Mutual submission is first. Say that with me. Mutual submission is first. That means me and Tammy are partners. Me and Tammy are partners. We were both made in the image of God. When I see her, I do not see a servant. I see a person is made in the image of God. When I see her, I don't see anybody inferior. God knows I don't see that. And she doesn't see anybody superior. We are equal. Even God said, even God said in Christ, there's neither male nor female. We are the same. So where do we, where does the submission come in, preacher? If there is supposed to be, watch, watch, here it is. Mutual submission means we come to the same conclusion about the decisions we make. But, but, we try our best to do that. We try our best to do that. But sooner or later, a husband and wife is going to not be able to do that. You try your best. You try your best to be on the same page for the direction and the decisions you make. 
because you mutually submit one to the other. But sooner or later, you're going to think left and he's going to think right. You're going to think red and he's going to think blue. I'm just using this. Somewhere down the line, you're not going to be able to completely 100% agree. Ladies, in this moment, you got to let him go. Because you're going to have to trust God that he's following God and submit to his authority. If this makes sense, say amen. Y'all are together. But I don't care. Somewhere along the line, there's going to be a time when you cannot agree on a decision. And ladies, it is that moment where you say, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to follow you. Amen? All right. So mutual, mutual submission is first. Number two, submission does not imply what? Inferiority. Galatians 3.28 clearly affirms that spiritually there is no difference between male or female. Jesus submitted to the Father. See that? Jesus submitted to the Father during his life on earth, yet he was not inferior to him. All right, number three. Number three. Submission is not what? Absolute. In other words, in other words, there is a limit. What is the limit? Paul said, as is fit in the Lord. In other words, if he tells you to do something that's out of bounds from the Lord, no go. All right, watch. Obedience in this passage is reserved for children and servants. There may be times when a wife must refuse to submit to her husband's desires if they violate God's word. Finally, the husband's authority is not to be exercised in an authoritative, overbearing manner. The wife's submission takes place in the context of a loving what? Relationship. So what does that mean? So what does that mean? If, if your husband says for you to come rob a bank with him, as a no-go. Because that violates scripture. Does this make sense? The, the authority and the submission is not absolute. It's in as it is fit to the Lord. And all God's people say it. Amen. You're probably not going to hear nothing else I say. But stand up anyway. All right. <clears throat> stand up anyway. Now, men, you're next. <clears throat> and don't bug out and don't come next week. Yes. Oh, it is vacation Bible school, isn't it? Well, we'll catch it up the following week. We, we're we're going to stay right with this. Stay right with this. Uh, listen, one day at a time. One day at a time. I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything I've been preaching in probably the last three or four weeks is easy to do. I don't. I mean, God has just been pouring it on us. And, and, but I do know this. I do know this. The closer we line up to this book, the more harmony we're going to have in our homes. The more harmony we're going to have in our homes. The Bible does not lie. You know what is amazing to me is how we can have so much confidence in for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then turn around and read a verse and say, well, I, I just don't know about that one. Listen, it's either all true or none of it's true. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, we're going to be dismissed. I don't know if you really want to go anywhere or not. But uh, if you do, I hope you got your snorkel. Amen. <laughs> all right. How many of y'all got something to eat tonight? Anybody got something to eat? Amen. We got, there were several. Several got, uh, uh, I got a cheeseburger or a hamburger. They, got, they had taco salad. I think that was good. Uh, what, what are they, where are they at? What are they going to have next week? Belisa, you know what they're going to have next week? I think barbecue. I think barbecue. barbecue? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, well, I ain't going to say that. I ain't going to say that. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Let's pray. Boy, we need that to calm down out there. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your blessings, your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all that you do. 
God, I pray that you'll bless us now as we go home. Help us to apply your word to our lives and our hearts. And God will thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I forgot something. Don't move. <laughs> now, men, now, men, I hope you paid attention more than just to elbow your wife tonight. Because all of that that they learned tonight, you're supposed to be doing the same thing toward God. Amen. Because as she submits to you, you submit to him. Amen. So that obedience, right? That obedience, yep. that respect, yep. that trust, you're supposed to be doing that to Christ. Amen. And you're a massive hypocrite if you're expecting her to submit and not you. And not you. And by the way, if you will, it'll be easier for her. So go home.